Well, let me just take uh, a few minutes before Brother Pat comes up here just to say a few things. Interesting tonight uh, that uh, Brother Pat is here and and then uh, the Ludens came and I got that right, right? Luden? No. Layden. I'm sorry. But well, we just met tonight, right? And my memory, uh, what's your name? My memory is not that good. Layden. I'm sorry. And I would have prepared myself for it had I known. But uh, in the records of this church, the name Layden shows up a, a quite a lot, actually, uh, because uh, the property uh, over here uh, was originally in uh, Layden's name. And I, I'm not recalling all of the details, but I know some of the work we've had to do with the county and tax exemption and all that. I've had to dive into some of that stuff. And, and so uh, the name is familiar, Brother Pat can say something if he wants to about that, but it's good to have the Laydens here with us. Actually, it was uh, Mr. Layden's father who was the um, owner of the property. Um, I uh, first met Brother Pat. Some of you have never met uh, the Horners. I think uh, that's true. You know the name because his name has been used around here, but you never met him. Uh, there's very few here that are here that were here at the beginning. Uh, when the Horners were here. But the Lord used uh, Brother Pat in the establishing of this church, of course, and I didn't meet him uh, and Diane until I think it was 1994, and I, I don't even recall the details. I think I read a newsletter, and then I called him because I was impressed by the things I read in the newsletter, and so I called him. That was back before you had all the Internet interaction, and um, we talked, and... I guess we must have hit it off. I don't know. I, I don't even remember, but we must have because uh, I invited him up to uh, Granite City, actually, to preach at Faith Baptist Church, and and he and Diane came up. I think it was just you two, right? Uh, in fact, in fact y'all were coming back from a trip, I think, from the Northeast maybe or something. I, yeah, that's been a long time ago. And um, I don't know. I, you know, we just kind of like kindred spirits in a lot of ways, and... So I came down in 1995 to the conference to preach for the first time. And then in 1999, uh, the Lord ordered in his providence that uh, I come down here. So the reason, humanly speaking, that I'm here is because of Pat Horner. And so y'all can blame him if you don't like that. But uh, uh, anyway, and so we've, uh, you know, our lives have, have, have we've, been close, we've been apart, we've been, there's been different stages in the relationship, uh, but I appreciate Brother Pat a lot, I always have, and God has used him, and uh, when I heard that he was going to be preaching over at Hilburn Drive, I thought maybe it'd be good if he could come over here and preach, and so that's why he's here, and I, you know, I was really encouraged Thursday night uh, hearing him preach from Ephesians 1 and the power of God, the grace of God, um, and we were in fact, somebody mentioned something about that uh, before the service. The impact of the gospel it doesn't leave you like it finds you. Uh, and that's the power of the gospel. And that was some of what was uh, uh, preached about um, Thursday night. Uh, I think that's really all I need to say, brother. You don't need any more introduction than that. Uh, and so let me let me just pray one more time and then... You come, and if you haven't had a chance to, to greet he or Sister Diane, please do so after the service. Father, we, uh, we depend upon you. Uh, you set apart instruments. We don't despise those instruments. We don't glory in the instruments. We glory in you, and we're asking that you would take this instrument tonight and that you would bless him and Bless us through him. I'm asking that you would give him liberty as he stands in this pulpit and that you would give us liberty to re receive the things that you have for us tonight. We're asking for these blessings not because we deserve them, but because you are merciful gracious, and gracious God because your son has purchased these blessings for us. And so we ask for them in his name. Amen. Amen. Change the, side, the height of the pool. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and man, it's good to be here with you all again tonight. Yes, there are new faces, people I don't know. 
But that's to be expected, right? If you're going to grow, if you're going to grow, then there are going to be people coming in that, uh, that I haven't met over the years, and that's fine. That's good. That's a blessing. One of the things I said at Hilburn Drive on Thursday night was that uh, we are part of a history that God is writing. We are part of a purpose that God is involved in and has been involved in uh, from the beginning. And uh, we could, I could spend the night telling stories about uh, his dad, Rick's dad, and, uh, and maybe I'll insert something into the message uh, tonight uh, concerning, uh, concerning uh, uh, um, Mr. Layden. Uh, he, was a, he was a dear friend to this church. He's a friend to me. Um, and um, I, I have I still tell stories uh, in fact before I knew anything about you and the Wilbers I was telling someone uh, over on the southwest side of San Antonio um, this week an account that took place um, um, back shortly after I had met your dad and uh, it's good to keep in mind brethren those things that God has done in our life it is good to remind yourself of the work of God in your soul and in your life. Um, you read the Psalms, and the psalmist is all, psalmists are always just stirring up remembrances. And um, because what God has done in the past is a token of what God will do today. We quote a verse uh, that says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Uh, and then we just go on and keep on going on our life. But yesterday has a yesterday has a meaning. Yesterday's important, and I don't want to forget. Uh, I don't want to forget the day God saved me. I don't want to forget the church I was brought in up in, uh, in for three and a half years that 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 did not teach me sound doctrine. I don't want to forget the the times God met with me in my studies, uh, bringing me to the doctrines of grace. I don't want to forget. That first church we started on the south side of San Antonio in May of 79. I don't want to forget those days when God brought us into this place. I was telling Rick out in the foyer there when we met over in that old building, that, that building leaned this way and that way. It was a delight to be there. <laughs> it was a joy to be there. God had provided us a place to meet. And we were thrilled. Still am. I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 tonight. And uh, thank you, brother, for this water because I'm going to need it. Thank you, brother Danny, for this pulpit. I'm glad you haven't changed it. <laughs> thank you for those scripture songs. Yes, I know. It was built to my specifications. <laughs> At Hilburn Drive this week. No, today, Sunday, it's the first of the week. At Hilburn Drive last week. We sang a song that we learned on the south side of San Antonio in 1979 or 80 when we first uh, started meeting over in that little house off the, off, I forgot, you forgot the name of the road now, Chandler Road. Yeah, John Wheeler taught us a, a song and we sang that, but 1980, and then Yesterday, we sang a song that we learned uh, uh, when David Leach came here. And he taught us uh, a song out of, uh, out of John, Ch out of John, John 10, My Sheep Know My Voice, and they follow me. And uh, after we sang it, he came up to me and said, It's good to hear y'all are still singing that song. Not the way I taught it to you, though. <laughs> we had a way of just changing it to fit us. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read the first four verses and I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 58. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that I preached unto you uh, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, 
that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And for the next several verses, the Apostle Paul deals with the doctrine of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and culminating in verse 58. Therefore, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, um, all uh, in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, Paul is making a conclusion based upon everything he has said, beginning in verse 1, coming to a concluding remark here, wrapping it up in one verse. In view of what I have just written to you, in view of the truths that I have just set down before you, in view of the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Oftentimes in the scriptures, you will find that when a truth is set forth, the writer will then draw a conclusion from that truth. In fact, brethren, doctrine by itself without obedience and practice is useless to us. It's just another religious thing to believe. Doctrine, the doctrine of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ should have such an impact upon our lives that it creates in us a firmness and commitment to serve the living God. We see this throughout the scriptures. When any truth is properly understood and considered, it must be followed by a conclusion which brings about certain results in our life. God is teaching us his word so that it produces something in us, a life. When truth is probably properly understood, results follow. And that's what we look for in our life and in our ministry. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith. What's the conclusion of that doctrinal statement? We have peace with God. This is the conclusion. This is part of the, the effects of understanding the doctrine of justification by faith, salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ by the free grace of God, the forgiveness of sins. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the doctrine. Here's the result. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. For you are bought with a price. Paul takes their minds and hearts back to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For you are bought with a price. And then says, therefore, what? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You're not your own anymore. When God saves you he and bought you and saved you, you cease to to be your own. You belong to Him now. God's property. Therefore, the conclusion of the matter is we should glorify God with our bodies and with our spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, another uh, expression of this, of this formula. Having therefore, uh, the, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, all the promises that have been listed in the previous chapters, uh, Paul now comes to a concluding statement, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There is a teaching throughout the word of God that reminds us over and over again that the truth imparted to us should have an impact and result in us living a certain way. And this is what Paul is saying to us 
in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 58, after having laid out so thoroughly the doctrine of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine of the saints being resurrected by the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes to this verse and says, therefore, in light of of the resurrection. If the resurrection of Christ is true, if the future resurrection of saints is true, therefore, be steadfast, be unmovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Therefore, this doctrine then spurs us and moves us forward in our work for our God. Be ye steadfast. The English word steadfast comes from a Greek word which means to be firm and immovable. Do not be moved off of the doctrine of the gospel which includes the doctrine of the resurrection. I don't know if you have seen yet uh, the Ligonier uh, survey of evangelicals. They put out one every uh, other year. and This is 2022, so they put one out this year. It is a sad state. People who think and believe themselves to be Christians no longer believe the truth of God's word. No longer believe certain things that are true, including that the word of God is true. Many of them. Paul is saying that the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ and the future resurrection of your body should cause you to become immovable regarding the gospel. Immovable concerning the truth that is set forth in the gospel message. The truth of the gospel affects our understanding of God the Father. The Jews did not grasp that. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 32 that God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. That doctrine that God is alive, that doctrine that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is alive, uh, impacts our life. We do not serve a dead God, brother, beloved. We serve a living God. He ascended to heaven. He's taken his place on his throne. And there he has all power and authority over heaven and earth. That's the God we serve. And the resurrection testifies to that. Be firm, Paul says, to this church, a good church with a lot of problems. A good church, a church that came behind in no gift and uh, yet had many, many struggles in many areas. And yet Paul's exhortation to them close to the end of this first epistle is you stand firm in what you understand the truth to be concerning the gospel. And that affects how you understand who God is. The truth concerning our Lord Jesus Christ is affected by that. Jesus Christ said in John 14 and verse 19, because I live. What are the next words? You shall live also. Yes, because I'm alive. You're alive. Because I'm alive, you have come into possession of everlasting life. And you shall never die when you have believed on me. Something has changed. Your pastor said that earlier. Something has changed. A lot has changed. But one thing that has changed is God has given us life in the place of death. And that's because Jesus Christ is a living God. Be ye steadfast. Do not be removed from this truth. Do not be removed from the truth that you have been saved by a resurrected Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of sinners and the only one who can save sinners. Do not be removed from this doctrine that he he rose from the dead after three days and ascended into heaven to take his place upon his throne. Do not be removed from the doctrine that you also shall be raised up by the same Lord and Savior who raised himself up. Do not be removed from that doctrine because that doctrine affects your duty in serving God. 
Be steadfast, unmovable in this thing. Be steadfast. Do not let strife or trials or cares of life or conflicts that arise, attacks by the evil one, your own personal failures cause you to quit following the Lord Jesus Christ or to cause you to quit serving the Lord Jesus Christ because there's a resurrection coming. And his resurrection is proof of that. Instead, Paul is saying, be rooted and grounded in a gospel message in the truth that there is a resurrection in the doctrines of God, in the truth concerning the gospel. Do not let the power of sin that remains in us. Do not let the wisdom of the world change your mind. Do not let the wisdom of men who are ever learning but never able to come to the truth of God's word. Do not let those things cause you to quit in your Christian life. Do not allow any deception of the enemy of your soul to seduce you so that you're moved away from the faith of the gospel. Instead, be steadfast. Not only steadfast, but unmovable. The Holy Spirit, speaking through the Apostle Paul, strengthens the next statement. Here is a strong statement, steadfast. Now he sets forth an even stronger statement. Be unmovable, derived from a Greek word which means not to be moved from the place where you are standing. They have been standing in the gospel. Verse uh, of, uh, uh, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also you have received, and wherein you stand. Where you stand firm and rooted and solid on the gospel. Don't be moved from that place where you are standing in relation to the gospel, in relation to Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Instead, be unmovable. Instead, be firmly rooted, persistent. Nothing is going to move me off the gospel. That's the dedication of your heart it is as I said a word that is stronger than steadfast and the Holy Spirit here is reemphasizing the the need for children of God to get settled on what they believe concerning the gospel and stand for it stand for it do not allow any circumstance or any people cause you to move away from any truth that has been settled from your study of the Word of God on the gospel issue. Paul writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 1, and he says in verse 23 to, to, concerning them, verse 22 he speaks about how God has saved them, and then says, if you continue, that's the opening words of verse 23, setting forth the doctrine of perseverance that the child of God that is genuinely converted continues, stays firm, moves forward, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's what he's saying to the Colossians which you have heard and which was preached under every creature which is under heaven, where of I, Paul, am a minister. If you continue in the faith, grounded and rooted and not moved away, you are a testimony that you are a genuine Christian. Whatever. I'm going to make this statement so don't tar and feather me, some of you that don't believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, when Paul said in the book of Hebrews, we are not of those that turn back again to, to perdition. We don't go back. We keep on believing. We have believed and we keep on believing because the Lord Jesus Christ is our only hope. And besides that, he's truth. Be unmoved. The contrast to that is found in the opening pages of Genesis in Genesis chapter 3 1 as the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said to the woman yea hath God said 
This great question that Satan had interjected into God's creation remains to this day so that we have two conflicting statements. Over here, the evil one saying, did God really say that? And over here, Paul saying, and the Holy Spirit saying, don't be moved off of what God has said. And so these two things are in constant conflict with each other, and we are still living in the, in the effects of that question raised by Satan himself, did God say that? God has said something, and it's preserved for us. And what God has said is that his son rose from the dead after three days. And then on the basis of that, he says, if you're a believer in him, one of these days he's going to raise you up too. Now, why is this important? We'll look in 1 Corinthians 5.12. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, not 5.12, 15.12. We'll go back to our chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Why is Paul emphasizing this so strongly here at the end of this chapter? 1 Corinthians 15, 12, Paul says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the grave, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? In that church, there were people who were questioning the doctrine of the resurrection. In that church, there were people questioning the, the implications of the gospel that Christ has died and was buried and rose again after three days. And Paul is saying in verse 12, Christ is preached that he rose from the dead. Then why are there people in your church saying he didn't? Right there. Is it possible? that in one of the Lord's churches, settled and grounded by an apostle, established on the authority of the scripture alone, is it possible that one could creep in and whisper in your ears and say, yea, hath God said? Yes, it is indeed possible. I've seen it in my ministry. I'm, I'm sure you have seen it in yours. We are very much aware and one of the greatest enemies uh, against truth comes in cloaked as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Saying, did God really say there was a resurrection? Did Jesus Christ really do that? That was right there in that church. How say some among you there is no resurrection of the dead? Drop down to verse 35. Paul addresses this same issue again. In verse 35, he says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? You see, here in this argument, they are not necessarily denying the resurrection. They're just questioning how it can be done. Well, Brother Pat, you believe in the resurrection? How in the world is God going to do that? I mean, Brother Pat, you die, you're going to go into the dust and the wind's going to blow you from the east and the west or the north and the south. And, and, and how is that going to happen, Brother Pat? God's going to raise you up on the last day. How is that going to happen? I mean, the people that die at sea, you know, Brother Pat, they get burned. I mean, can that really happen? You see, they're not dying. and They're not denying the resurrection. They're simply asking the kind of questions that get you to say, well, maybe then. It's not true. So you have these two things going on at the same time in this church at Corinth. So Paul comes and deals with this issue of the resurrection and he nails it down and comes to the end of this chapter and it says, you stand fast and don't move off of this. Already in your church, there's some that is questioning this doctrine. Not this church. <laughs> I'm quoting Paul here. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 16, 17, and 18. And he says to Timothy, but shun profane and vain babblings. I love that old language. Teaching and preaching that is nothing but vain babblings. We would be too kind to use that kind of word today. All he's doing is babbling. 
but shun profane and vain babblings. Paul says to Timothy, verse 17, for their word, that babbling has a word coming out of his mouth. Their word will eat as doth a canker of whom Hymenius and Phil Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection's already passed, or passed already, and overthrow the faith of some. What a powerful statement that a false doctrine can overthrow the faith of some. Their word doth eat like a canker, he says. The Greek word translated canker is a word used where we get our word gangrene. The actual meaning is to kind of gnaw, slowly chewing away at the truth of the gospel, at the truth of God's word, slowly like a cancer spreading, taking away bits and pieces of it till it consumes the whole of the thing. All the healthy part of God's word that's left is being slowly consumed by the error that is in place. That's what Paul is teaching us here. The words of those who seek to turn God's people away from truth, he says, will lead them to ungodliness, verse 16. 2 Timothy 2.16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. These words that seek to turn people away from the truth of God's word produces an ungodliness in their life, produces more and more sin in their life. Verse 17 it teaches us, uh, verse 18 that is, teaches us that false doctrine has a tendency to overthrow the faith of some. Some of the weaker saints uh, end up believing the error. And some even to the place where they deny the faith. So this is critical, what Paul is telling us to do here. This exhortation, this command to, to be steadfast and unmovable, this is, this is critical, you see, because, because error has an impact as much as truth can. Truth has an impact to change our life, but as error creeps in, so does the ungodliness that affects our life. And we are seeing and uh, over and over again over the years, I've watched churches, I'm not talking about this one, I've watched churches embrace a doctrine here or a doctrine there that no longer exists today. I've watched churches divide over a doctrine over the years of my ministry that no longer exists today. It just has a deadening effect, a killing effect. Let it not be said of Community Baptist Church of Elmendorf, Texas, that this is what happened. I'm thankful to, to hear what is coming across, that is coming across from this pulpit and to hear the songs you're still singing, the scriptures and things like that that encourage my heart. Talk to the saints and have them express themselves in the truth of the scriptures. The doctrines of true Christianity beloved, are so intricately interconnected, so closely interconnected and so interdependent that one cannot be corrupted without the other one being affected. We oftentimes do not think that way. We don't think in terms of the whole, well, it's just a little thing over here. And we give up a little thing over here, but we don't seem to realize that the whole package is connected together. And there's something eating over here that's going to end up affecting the whole package eventually. Why do great denominations end up declining into liberalism? How did that happen? Once great men, uh, we're talking about um, uh, John Stott, I, I don't know if I, or uh, I'm sorry, J.I. Packer. There's some men that I have read after in the beginning, they, they wrote some really, really good stuff. 
And when at the end of their life, they're not so good anymore. How does that happen? How does, how does a denomination that leaves Rome with a fervency goes back to Rome? How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. It happens by ignoring the fact that everything that we believe is connected together. And if we give up this little inch, the whole is coming to an end. Maybe not in our generation, maybe not in our children's generation. But it happens. The whole history of Christianity is a testimony to this. Paul is warning them, don't be moved off of what you have come to believe. John Gill writes, so the errors and heresies of false teachers worm, I love that language, worm and spread and feed upon the souls of men and eat up the vitals of religion and even destroy the very form of godliness. And when they get into, when they get, that is false doctrine, into Christian churches, threaten to ruin, threaten the ruin of them. And thus we're exhorted, stand fast, be unmovable. And then he comes and says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Abounding means to increase from a fixed amount. That is, that in the beginning of your Christian life, when God saved you and gave you repentance and faith and graced you and gifted you, there was, there was a beginning. Paul says, continue and abound. Did God bestow love in your heart and soul when he saved you? Then abound in that. Did God give you faith? Then abound in that. The scriptures are full of exhortations in this particular area. Abounding means to increase from the place of beginning. Not to just remain where you're at. We've got this, this idea among Baptists today that 25, 30 years ago I prayed this prayer and I got in and I'm good and I'm fine, I'm okay, and I'm not any different than I was back then. 30 years later I'm exactly the same, but it's okay I prayed that prayer. That's not the teaching of the Scriptures. Just the opposite. That what God begins, He continues to work. Grace is effectual and it works in our life. And it may be in some that is slow and we grow by inches. Others grow by feet. Others more. Who knows? I don't understand the work of God. I stopped trying to figure it out a long time ago. Simply saying this, if you belong to the Lord, you had a beginning and you will have a continuation. So, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, Therefore, as you abound in everything, wow, he could have put a period there and all of us would be in a little bit of trouble here tonight. But as you abound in everything, comma, and then he begins to list the things that they are abounding in. And Second Corinthians 8, 7, you're abounding in faith and utterance, your ability to speak and communicate the things of God in knowledge, you're growing in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're abounding in all diligence, what you started out as youthful zeal and zeal without knowledge has continued into a faithful diligence of serving the Lord Jesus Christ, abounding in all diligence and in your love to us, abounding in love. And then he says, see that you abound in this grace also. And the grace he's talking about there is a grace of giving, but I don't want to focus on giving tonight, but that's what he's talking about. See that you abound in all areas of grace in your life. Some of us have strengths in one area, some strengths in another. We have weaknesses in one area, weaknesses in others. We look at our life, honestly, if we will, and examine ourselves in light of the word of God. And we say, this is what God has done in my life. These are my aspirations. These are my desires. This is what God has done. This is how God has used me. But look at this. It's not there yet. And what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, you have some things that are good. Don't settle down for the few things that you have that are good and be content with those things. But there are other areas also that you should be abounding in. And that's his exhortation to the Corinthians in this next letter. Don't settle down, as I have often said, 
for status quo religion. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes to that church and says, And the Lord Jesus Christ make you increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, and even as we do toward you. Abounding in love. There are areas in our life and oh, where we need to increase. Love is one of them. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12, the previous chapter before where we're at tonight, even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel. The English word excel is the same word abound. See that you excel in edifying the church. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 12. See that you abound in your ability to build up the saints. That means we're going to have to know something of the Word of God to be able to help the saints. It means you're going to have to know something about how to pray, to pray for brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. It means you're going to have to be intimately involved in each other's life. And this brother is struggling here. How can I help him? How can I build up the Lord's church? What will God do in my life to help this church? That should be the question of every member here. See that you abound, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Truth should produce a holy desire to increase in more truth. Love should produce a holy desire to increase in more love. These things are worked in us. Giving, increase in more. Love, as I said, increase in more. Edifying, increase in more. Christianity is about growth, not standing still, but moving forward. But our text is not about knowledge and love and these things that Paul is speaking of. Our text is about works. It's about service. And what he is exhorting this church to do uh, in this text is that they abound in their work for the Lord. Now, this church has had a testimony of working for the Lord. Okay? But Paul is exhorting us to abound in it. The word here is, yes, you've got something. Don't settle for what you got. Go beyond where you're at. And that includes the work that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. In the work of the Lord... It refers to the good works that the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to do and that which he calls his children to do and to perform. It includes everything from giving a cup of cool water in the name of a prophet to evangelizing the nations. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 and speaking here, uh, Paul speaking here says, who, speaking of Jesus Christ, gave himself for us that we might re he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous. Zealous of what, brother? Good works. Zealous of good works. What can I do today to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? What can I do to help someone along their way in the kingdom of God? Mr. Layden helped us. I mean, it took six weeks to find him, and then he found out. And I found out he'd been saving the property for five years. People had got, he'd had opportunity to sell it, and he didn't. Why? I want a Baptist church there. So I show up on his doorstep. <laughs> he doesn't know me from anybody. And we talk, and I want to start a Baptist church on that property. What, 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 how do we get it? Well, do you have any money? No, I don't have any money. <laughs> we got three families and one of them left after a few months. And uh, well, this is what we do. We'll rent it to you. Okay, good, good. We'll rent it. And, but if you come a, a month where you can't pay the rent, you just let me know. It's going to be okay. I want to see a Baptist church there. And I, Mr. Layton, brother, we can't, we, we can't pay the rent this month. Ah, oh, don't worry about it, Brother Pat. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I want to see a Baptist church there. And water went out. Remember the water well went out? 
He comes out here with his crew, pulls the thing up, puts in a new pump and new pipe in the water well. That's right out here. No charge. And didn't add it to the cost of things. I just want to see a church here, he said. And he found out I was both bivocational. What do you do? Well, I, I, um, I, I do uh, construction work. I'm, I, I carpenter work, paint. What, you paint? Yeah, my dad was a paint contractor. I paint. Oh, my house needs to be painted. All right, come over to my house. He sent, sent me over there. He was there, and I'm walking around this house. Uh, and I said to him, brother, I said, your house doesn't need to be painted. I want my house painted, Brother Pat. And every day he would come at lunch and bring a lunch, and we'd sit down and talk for an hour or two. And I'm thinking, i got to get busy on this house. And he'd just be talking, and we'd talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the day came and Rick was there and, and, and uh, he, was, he was close to dying and we hadn't been able to pay off the note yet. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, he took all of our rent money as a down payment and called me said, I'm having a good day. My wife is here. My son is here. You come over. Bring your checkbook. How much do you owe? And the story's in the book. And I tell him and he says to his wife, write him a check. And then he says to me, write me a check. He said, I'm going to die soon, and I want that property clear because I want to see a Baptist church there. What can I do to help someone along in the kingdom of God? Well, he helped us and left a mark on my life that has not been erased all these years. He helped us. Now, look, every one of us has struggles, right? Everyone has got problems. But what can we do if we name the name of Christ to abound in the work of the Lord? The Bible teaches us that God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things. You ought to memorize this verse. I'm reading 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. God's grace bestowed upon you will produce the ability to abound in good works. Ah, Brother Pat, I'm old and I'm tired and I'm sick and I'm weak. What can you do? William Carey went to the mission field to go to India. He and his wife and his and uh, his Sister was supposed to go, and, and she became ill. Eventually bedridden. They corresponded back and forth by letter, and she would write, I pray for you. I pray for you. I can't do anything. I'm in this bed. I can't move. I can't even get out of this bed. But I pray for you. And he would write back and tell his sister, you are in a place where God has put you. You were doing what God would have you to do. I'm over here in India and you're praying for me. And I'm convinced with all my heart when William Carey stands before the throne of grace, before the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to say, come over here. Come this is my sister. She prayed. You know that. She prayed for me. That may be my unsanctified imagination going on forever, but God knows something about that woman laying on her deathbed praying for her brother halfway around the world. God knows. She was abounding in the work she could do. What can you do? Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord and pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. What can you do? What good work can you do? For, Paul says, abound in good works. For, Paul says, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Back to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. How do they know? How do we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord? 
How does William Carey's sister laying on her sickbed praying for her brother in India know that her labor is not in vain in the Lord? How, dear sister, that are weak and frail, dear brother who is struggling here or there, do you know that your labor, whatever it is, in the Lord is not in vain? How do you know it? I'm going to tell you how you know it. Because God told you it wasn't. Because God said it. Because God told us, your labor's not in vain. Dear friend of mine, dear loved one of mine, dear brother, dear, 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 dear child of mine, your labor's not in vain. God said that. I'm not the preacher saying it. God said it. And we come back to what I said earlier. Has God said anything? And God said something here. And what did God say? He said your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He didn't say what kind of labor. He didn't say preaching is not in vain in the Lord. He didn't say mission work is not in vain in the Lord. He said your labor to every member of that church in Corinth. He said your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything related to Christianity should be based upon what God has said to us. Everything. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God won't forget. How do I know He's going to remember, Brother Pat? Don't worry about it. God's not going to forget. God's not going to forget. It's not in vain. It's not useless. It's not worthless. It has some value in the kingdom of God. What you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ has some value in the kingdom of God. You say, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. I'm running out of time here, but I, let me tell you a story. We had a, we, we started church on the south side of San Antonio in 1979 and, 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 and I, I went in the ministry without working. I wasn't bi, uh, bivocational at the time. I was committed to just the ministry. It was small, committed to live on whatever God provided. And it came a day when we had nothing in the house, nothing in the refrigerator, nothing in the cabinets, but enough beans for a meal. And my wife burned them. And she said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I don't know, but we stood in, in that kitchen on Southport, across the street from those folks right there. They didn't know, nobody knew, but our God knew. And we said, Lord, you said, give us this day our daily bread. The phone rang. Mrs. Cannon, up the street. We've been working with her. She's elderly lady, all kinds of problems. Always told me, Brother Pat, I don't think I'm doing anything in the kingdom of God. She said, Brother Pat, I, I've been fixing a roast meal. I've got vegetables. I've got bread. I've got tea. I've got dessert. And suddenly realized, I can't eat all this food. She's alone. She's been divorced. She lives up there in that house alone. She said, do you think you and your family could come up to here and, and, and share a meal with us? I said, yes, man, I think we can. Hung up the phone. I said, Diane, give us this day our daily bread. God just gave it to us. Let's go. We're going to have a meal. And so we walked up the street, went into her house, sat down. She, we fellowshiping and rejoicing and eating roast beef dinner and, and dessert. And she gets up and she goes to the, uh, to the uh, kitchen and she says, oh, to Tomorrow's your birthday, Brother Pat, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And so she's pulling down groceries and putting them in paper grocery bags, not these plastic things, but paper bags full of groceries. And she's filling them up from her pantry. And I'm watching this going on. So what she's doing, she said, oh, and you need a cake. And she reached up and put a cake mix in there. And she said, y'all take this home. I'm sure you could use it. So we're walking down the streets carrying two grocery bags full of groceries to our house. Nobody knows. And we get home and load up our pantry again. And the next day I pick up the phone and I call Mrs. Cannon. I said, Mom, I called her Mom Cannon. Mom, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about a lady who feels like God never, ever uses her. 
let me tell you what happened yesterday. And I'm crying and she's crying, Brother Pat, oh, I can't believe this. You have no idea what God might do. Your work is not in vain. Your work is not in vain. It was a long time before I told that story. We got a bunch of stories like that. Your work is not in vain. The Lord takes note of it. And so you be steadfast. And you be immovable. There's some things that we believe that cannot ever change. You be unmovable. And you go on and serve the Lord, whatever God gives you opportunity to do so. And you look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you trust Him. One of these days we're going to die. And we're going to lay us in the grave. And we're going to die in hope of a resurrection of the righteous. To stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive a crown for faithfulness and then cast it at His feet. To say he is worthy. He is worthy. Amen. Let's pray together. Father bless your word and help this church.